Hi there, my name is Gavin Nielsen and this is the fourth session in the uh, Coastal Defense Project. Um, we're going to be talking about the Simulink environment fundamentals today. And uh, yeah, so let's get started. When Before we get to the, the table of contents, the reason there's a switching track on this page is because I want you to think about Simulink a little bit like train tracks. Um, where we're directing signals and data around and switching it as we need to. Whereas thinking about coding and stuff like that inside MATLAB is more like a recipe. Um, they, they accomplish the same thing, it's just a, a different way of thinking about it. So, let's go forward. Um, like I said, this is the, the fourth session. Overall, our um, purpose here is to talk about modeling simulation and analysis and um, the next the next session in session five we'll start to talk about the project but uh, up until now we've been doing we did a bouncing ball project first we modeled a piano second we did a little photoshop uh, imitation i guess you'd say uh, last time in session three and this time we're going to introduce a new environment so that's a simulink um, that's a, an add-in to MATLAB, but it, it is in and of itself um, kind of a different platform, um, even though they play well together. So today's agenda is we're going to talk about block diagram representations and model structures and abstractions, just so we, we cover the um, appropriate modeling concepts. And then we're going to introduce Simulink, talk about its context, talk about the environment, and talk about how to think, how to, um, where to place signals and blocks in your imagination so we can kind of cross them over. And then we're going to just work on converting the bouncing ball today. So we've spent a decent amount of time on that already. I don't need to explain the problem again, but let's translate it. That way you have kind of a, a way to think about what equals what and, and what doesn't equal what. <laughs> um, and then we can talk about refactoring the blocks and visualize it analyze it and all that kind of stuff all right so the first thing we need to talk about is representational agnosticism and yes I agree this is kind of a mouthful but um, what do I mean by this well I mean that we shouldn't really care how we represent things um, they should be accurate they should be as simple as possible but whether we do it with code or with block diagrams or, or whatever, I think ultimately that should be whatever's the fastest thing that we can use that gets us you know, from point A to point B. So some of those factors are the speed, like I said, um, how fast can you complete the model? Um, how easy is it to communicate what the model is? Maybe you're giving the model to someone else um, uh, part of it might be the ease of modification. You know, you might create a model in such a way that it's hard to modify later, and you know you're going to need to modify it. So that's that's an important concern. And long-term flexibility. You know, maybe the uses that you are creating the model for. Uh, maybe there's a lot of them, and maybe in the long term it's best to do something a different way. So my point here is the quote best representation depends completely on what it is you're trying to do. And uh, I'm not saying MATLAB and Simulink are the only ways to do this, um, but they're certainly a good way. And um, so <laughs> it almost seems uh, silly to define representation at this point, but I'm going to anyway. Um, and it's something such as a picture or symbol that stands for something else. Um, so we're just talking about different ways to represent um, an algorithm or a model. So why don't we move forward with that. So now to introduce block diagramming methods. So the idea is basically that you just draw a picture to represent actions and relationships. Um, and values are moved around by signal lines. So that's what I was talking about with the train track stuff. Um, that we, we want to think of it as if we are we are um, kind of making a pipeline of data 
and then what do we do with the data that's in the pipes? Um, so the signals carry around the values, but then actions are performed by blocks. So at the bottom of this, di uh, this uh, page, this slide, we have a real simple block diagram that has a constant four block, and that's outputting a signal. Then we name that signal X, and then we have a constant gain block of five, which multiplies X times something, creates a new signal Y, and then we sum X and Y together to produce Z, and then we have a terminator block. Okay, so if we look in the upper right-hand corner, here's kind of the equivalent uh, bit of code in MATLAB that we'd write. We'd say X is equal to four, and then Y is equal to five times X, and then we'd say Z, which is our last signal, is equal to X plus Y. So there's our, our first kind of uh, translation. So one thing I want to point out is that it seems like you'd want to say variables, uh, the, the closest relative of variables is a block, like a constant or something like that. But really, um, within Simulink, uh, variables in terms of something that's holding a value currently that we can plug into other things, the, the better analog is the signal. Um, and it's sort of odd because variables within a MATLAB code hold on to that value for a new time step. And signals are, are a bit more transient. They, they have it for the particular time step that they're driven by it. Sort of like if you're pumping water through a, a hose, it's only while you're pumping water through it that it holds that flow or, or that value or that pressure. Um, then functions or actions are, are better analog to blocks. So in a sense, you might say a constant value is a function. It always returns this particular value. Um, you could talk about an operator like multiplication as a function, and we do here uh, with the gain block. See, that's representing the multiplication and addition. So anyway, that's, that's your first introduction. So let's extend this a little bit and, and talk about a, a, a little bit more complex diagram. Um, so first, let's walk through the left-hand upper side and talk about the MATLAB code of what this does. Um, so we're going to create a time vector. If you recall um, the syntax, the time vector t starts at time 0, takes time, uh, takes time steps 0 0.01 in size, and creates values all the way up until the value 10. So in other words, it would have 0, 0 0.01, 0 0.02, 0 0.03, all the way up to 10.00. Okay, so now we have this vector of times, and we're, then we're going to create uh, some variables x, y, and z. Um, and we're going to use this higher function, and I, I apologize, I have it in there as cosine of t and cosine of t. Uh, I meant cosine and sine. <laughs> um, but you'll forgive me, just, uh, just switch those around in your head. So x is cosine of t, y is sine of t, and then z is t over 4. And then our final result, d, for distance, is x squared plus y squared plus z squared to the 1 half power, or to the square root power. And um, we know that all of these are going to have the same length as t because we said x is a variable based on cosine of t, and t is some vector. So these are all going to be vectors. Well, in, in um, so let's, let's look at what the Simulink example looks like. We have this clock now as t, and we don't have to initialize it to be a certain length. Um, we just say that there's a clock, and that clock corresponds to simulation time. So as time goes by, the vector of values is automatically created. But so at those time instances, we can actually feed the current time, the current value, which is a scalar, not a vector, that t signal can be fed into functions. And so here we have it. And again, I apologize, they're, they're backwards again. <laughs> so the, the x should be going through a cosine wave 
the Y should be going through a sine wave, but you get the idea. It's, it's passing through a block that's making it, uh, it's behaving as a function. Um, and then, of course, the T is going through a gain block that divides it by 4. It takes T and divides it by 4. By the way, this is a, um, this is the function of a corkscrew, a, um, I'm forgetting the name, but, but basically a, uh, something that corkscrews up in our case. So X and Y are a circle and T increases at a particular rate based on, uh, Z increases at a particular rate based on T, so you can think of this thing corkscrewing up. Okay, now in order to form D, we need to square each of those signals. So you can see here uh, X goes through the U squared block, Y goes through U squared block, Z goes through U squared block, which is all of these values. And then they're all added up, which is these operators together. And that sum is that is taken as the square root, which is right here, taken as driven to the uh, half, one half power. So that's this. And that forms D. And it goes to a terminator. Um, so ultimately, it's driving D through a series of values. Um, and again, <clears throat> I want to point out one of the key features of Simulink is that it actually has an explicit notion of time, whereas MATLAB, we, we, needed, we needed to define time ourselves. Um, and that's a um, really useful thing because most of the time we, are, we need time. We need to be able to refer to it. Um, so that's that's one useful way of thinking about this another another is that we kind of imply that things are happening simultaneously you know T seems to be going into X Y and Z to form X Y and Z uh, all at the same time they're all in parallel where here they're sequential and that's you can actually leverage that um, in some ways that's really useful um, and we'll, we'll talk about uh, algebraic loops and other things later where Simulink can't you know maybe the definitions don't allow it to do things in exact parallel um, but it's a very useful way of thinking about the fact that that X doesn't have a dependence on Y or I should say Y doesn't have a dependence on X even though in this code Y comes after X in the in the block diagram you can see that they're totally independent of each other okay so digging a little bit deeper um, how do we configure each of these things so if we double click on a block um, and I'll do this in just a second we can see that the uh, sine wave will bring up these parameters and there's a few more parameters but I just showed you the key ones here we wanted to use an external signal, so it has this uh, external input port. We want it to be time-based. Um, we want the amplitude to be 1, the bias to be 0, particular frequency, and uh, no phase offset. The same way we double-clicked on this gain block, and we got, we got to put in whatever gain we want and tell it how to multiply. So let's switch over to Simulink real quick um, and do this. So here we are in Simulink. Don't want to go too too long without actually getting in there and doing something, right? Okay. So we'll just make this a little bit smaller so we can see the model. Now here's the library browser. So we'll click on that and we'll this kind of gives us a palette of things to pull from. So the first thing we want is this clock. And uh, we'll pin this here so that it is always on top. So I'm going to go to sources. You think of the sources of signals. And here's the clock. Drag and drop it onto here. Okay. And then I'm going to go to math operations. 
and I should be able to find a sine wave in here. I'm going to search real quick. There it is. Sine wave, sine wave function. Okay, so I'm going to drag and drop this. It's going to prompt me for a number. If I don't do anything, it'll stay, leave the default. Now, before I connect these things, I just want to show you <clears throat> double clicking on them brings up that exact same. Just unpin this for a second. Brings up that um, parameter dialog box, and we can see these things here of using a particular amplitude, a bias, frequency, and a phase. Um, another way, if we don't want to use the uh, library browser, maybe we know what we want, we know the name of it, we can actually click in the area here and type gain for example. Um, and we can, just to save time, put in our gain of one fourth. Okay, so now we've got a few. Uh, we're going to, I right clicked and dragged and uh, created an, another copy of this. And for this one, because um, I want this to be the cosine, I'm going to say it has a pi over two phase difference. And then I'll rename the block cosine wave. Or how about cosine function? Oops, there we go. Sine function. All right, now I'm going to drag these things around. You'll notice it ha provides little guides here, and then there's like a faint arrow. I can click on that arrow and connect these things. Um, and those are useful to, uh, for a lot of reasons. Um, put the cosine there and the sine there. I can drag backwards from an input port to go onto that signal. If I hold down control, I can drag forwards out to that. And that's called a pickoff point. So there's a lot of different ways to connect. Okay, now I need something that raises um, something to the squared power. So I think this is in math operations. Let's just take a look here. Math function, I believe. So we'll put that here. And we don't really want to raise e to the u. We want to raise u to the second. So I'm going to double click on it. And this has particular block parameters. I'm going to go down to magnitude squared. Say OK. And that's good. Just right clicking and dragging. I'm going to highlight these three and right click and turn off show block name just to clean this up a little bit. And then I'm middle clicking and dragging in order to pan here. If I scroll the wheel, it'll zoom in and out. Okay, now I need an add block, which is probably in math operations. And probably at the top. Huh? Yep, there it is. Okay, but this only has two inputs. And we can see from our diagram that we need three. So I'll double click on it. And instead of having two pluses, I'll just make it three pluses. Okay, I'll hover over this. And you can see the... Uh, resize handles are there. So I'm going to drag it down, connect these up. Very good. Okay, now I need the square root. So I'm going to search for that, SQRT. And there it is, square root. Okay, now I'm going to Click once on that blocks and hold block and hold down Control and press R to rotate. You can do this through the menus too. Just right click on a block and go down to rotate and flip. And you can see you can rotate it and flip it around and things like that. Um, send it forward and backward on the canvas and uh, change the formatting of it for 
shadows and colors and block names and fonts and everything. So there's lots of different things to, to make it more represent whatever you're trying to do. Um, but this is what we need right now. And then we're going to add a terminator. Now the purpose of a terminator is just like it says, uh, it's to terminate a signal. So if it wasn't there, I'm going to get rid of it, the signal actually becomes invalid. So this isn't a valid signal anymore. And since we want the signal, but we aren't going to do anything with it after this, that's why we create a terminator. Okay. All right. Now there's still one thing a little different from that diagram and this diagram, and that's the fact that there's T's and X's now. Um, these labels here, T's and X's, Y's, Z's, D's. Now we can just double click anywhere. Like if we click once, we can type something and that'll you know, search for a new block, but that's not really what we want. If we double clicked, we could add comments. I like the color white. You know, we could add something that sort of just like the way we'd add comments in MATLAB, we can just put these things anywhere. We can copy and, you know, paste them. Um, and put these wherever we wanted but we want to name actual signals. So I'm going to highlight these and delete them. And I'm going to double click on the signal. Now you can see that that signal is highlighted and it's got a little flashing cursor. I'm going to call that T. Okay, and I'm going to do the same thing here for X and Y and Z and then finally for D. Okay, now I'm going to save this, and I'll just call it uh, model one, mod one. Okay, very good. I'm going to run this, and it finished. It has one warning. Why don't we just look at that warning real quick? Um, I'm saying there's not much to do here but we'll do it for you. <laughs> um, so that's just a warning, it's, it's not a big deal. One thing you'll notice is, hey, how do we see what happened? Um, and that's why we'll add things like displays. So if I add a display here, and connect it somewhere, It went very fast, but this is the final value. So at time 10 was our final value. Um, and to uh, prove that to you, let's hook it up to T. And so the final value for T should, of course, be 10. And it is. OK, but we may want to see more transient kinds of things. So why don't we put a scope on? And here we'll add, say, run, and look inside the scope by double clicking on it. Here we go. And as we'd expect, at time two, the value of time was two, and at time four, the value of time was four. And, and that makes sense, because we're just plotting one variable versus itself. So it should be a line. But maybe uh, we want to look and see, make sure we did these things right. So maybe we put a scope here on the cosine. And we'll run this again. OK. So here's the cosine. It starts at 1 and at 2 pi, or about 6.28. We go through one cycle because it has uh, one radian per second speed. So at 2 pi seconds, it should finish one cycle. So that looks right. Um, how about how about z? Is z looking right? We should be whatever time is times a quarter. So 0 to 2.5 since time goes to 10. That makes sense. Okay. All right. So you kind of have an idea how this works. Basically set up what we want and press play. Um, good.
Okay, now let's talk a little bit about model abstractions. So in MATLAB, we have something called a function, which we've talked about and used a bunch of times. Um, and it has this prototype um, syntax of keyword function, and then the outputs, and they equal the name of an input, or excuse me, the name of a function, the, the name that we're naming the function, <laughs> and whatever the input parameters are. Okay, well, and then obviously beneath, we define how to calculate the inputs based, um, how to calculate the outputs based on the input. So here, we're just converting, um, we're converting R and theta to X and Y. Okay, so, in, like I said, in MATLAB, we have functions, but in Simulink, we have this notion called subsystems. And subsystems are great because they take all the complexity of whatever's inside of them and only expose the things that you need. Um, so in our case, we could have a subsystem named comp for components, and inputs R and theta, just like we have here and outputs X and Y, just like we have here. So let's actually make this, but we'll, um, just to give you a heads up what we will do, we'll use sine and cosine, we'll use the prog function, and then we'll use these new blocks called uh, imports and outports. So let's do that real quick. We'll roll over there. So first thing I'm going to do is create a subsystem. I'll show you where that's at in the library. Uh, it's over at ports and subsystems, and there's a lot of different ones. Um, we're not going to talk about all of them. Um, we're just going to stay simple first off, and we're going to use a regular generic subsystem. Okay. And then what else do we need? We're going to first, okay, I want to point something out actually. I'm going to save this and I'm going to call it subs1. Okay, so this is the name. This is a lot like a folder tree, like in Windows Explorer, or you know, maybe you're clicking into a website and it's deeper in the folder structure of the website, something like that. Um, when you go into a subsystem, and I'm gonna remember we, we call, wanted to call this comp for components. So I'll call that comp. If I double click on that, you can see that it's I'm showing. I'm in the subs model and in the comp subsystem. And now I can zoom in, zoom out, this whole this whole palette, this whole, uh, not palette, this whole design space is of comp. So if I hit escape, it says, oh, okay, we're, we're kind of zooming out. Uh, if I double click on it, we're zooming in. I can click back to go back one. So that it just kind of lets you zoom in and zoom out. So I'm gonna go into this. I'm going to break this sigma line here, delete it, and I know I want R and theta, so let's name these R. I'll click once on it, control C, control V. Now I have another import, I'll call this theta. I know I want an outport called X. I'm going to right click and drag. I'm just showing you different ways. You don't have to use the same ways to do it every time, X and Y. Okay, highlight both of those and move them over. Okay, so we needed the sine wave and the product. So let's uh, let's pull that in. Sine wave function. <clears throat> All right. So remember, for x, we need to create a phase. It's the same as a sine wave, it just has a phase difference of pi over 2 radians. Pi is, is a internally defined constant, so we don't have to define what that is. But that's fine. And for theta, well for y rather, um, we can make this 0 again. We don't need a phase offset. Okay, let's take a look at our deal here. 
we need to pull in theta to the sine and cosine and let's let's rename these so we don't forget which one's which so sine wave function sine wave function okay and actually we'll we'll just push enter here to put that on the next line it makes it look a little bit nicer okay then we need a product so I'm just I clicked once on the screen and typed product and that gives us product and we need two inputs so that's fine and I'm gonna right click and drag and I don't really need to know their products I can tell from the symbol so I'm gonna highlight both of them right click go down to format and uncheck show block name Okay, so I know that theta needs to plug into both of these, and, I, and then we'll forward that on, whatever those output, and then we'll plug in R for radius to multiply by both of those, and then we will output X and output Y. All right, so if I save this, and back out of it. Sure enough, I have inputs R and theta, outputs X and Y, and all the details. This isn't too bad, but um, it, it hides some of the it hides the details from us. So we only have to think about inputs and outputs, just the way functions work. Great. All right. So, like I said, there are a lot of other abstractions inside Simulink. Um, just like there are other ones inside MATLAB, um, but because of time and because of uh, how we're going to approach this, we're just going to talk about that one today. Um, you can actually write MATLAB functions inside of Simulink. You can use something called an S function, uh, which most of the time has to do with writing C code. Um, you can write what's called Simulink functions, which uh, are pretty interesting. Uh, way of thinking about reusing uh, Simulink diagrams inside a Simulink diagram. Um, there's interpreted MATLAB functions, which basically can call anything from within MATLAB. So it could call any custom script that you write. And then there's there's domain specific abstractions, things like 3D objects, um, physical systems like circuits or magnetics or gearbox. You know things that are abstracting um, a, a physical domain or are abstracting some other kind of domain that you want to specify. Um, so there's a lot of different kinds of abstractions that you can use and it just depends on what you're doing. Uh, and I also wanted to note here that signals are implicitly vectorized um, unless you specifies otherwise, specify otherwise. And that just means that the same most of the time, it depends on how you define things, but most of the time, if you define a Simulink diagram, uh, it doesn't, it will automatically resize itself if you need to put a scalar through it or if you need to put uh, a vector through it or a matrix or a three dimensional array or however, however big you need to go. Um, obviously, there's some, some notable examples that. Uh, if you're trying to pick something out of, of a complex signal, a uh, higher dimensional signal, I should say, that you have to be careful about how you define you, those vectorized signals. So um, it can't automatically know what you want when things are ambiguous. But things like, you know, um, adding things together, for example, as long as they're compatible signal sizes, it can do automatically for you. So there's some there's some neat uh, things you get for free. So we've talked around it a little bit and we've talked about what it is. Let me tell you what MathWorks website says Simulink is. Uh, Simulink is a block diagram environment for multi-domain simulation and model-based design. It supports simulation, automatic code generation, and continuous test and verification of embedded systems. 
Simulink provides a graphical editor, customizable block libraries, and solvers for modeling and simulating dynamic systems. It is integrated with MATLAB, enabling you to incorporate MATLAB algorithms into models and export simulation results to MATLAB for further analysis. Um, so just to break that down a little bit, um, multi-domain simulation, just, you know, maybe you have you, you have an electrical system and you want to put it next to a hydraulic system and you want to put that next to a software system. Um, those are all different domains and it's saying you can put them all together. Um, Model-based design is, a, is kind of a paradigm of how to go about designing something based on models. That, that makes sense, right? But uh, there's more to it than just the, the verbiage. Um, really is a different approach a lot of times and makes you explicitly model um, the whole thing, which has a lot of great side effects. Um, it talks about code generation here, um, which means generating code, but it, there's different types of code, right? So it can generate C code or C++ code. It can generate um, hardware description languages like VHDL or Verilog. It can generate PLC type of code, like structured text, um, and that, that covers a very vast variety. Um, and then it, it, a vast variety of targets. And then the last sentence, the last uh, phrase there in the sentence says, and continuous test and verification of embedded systems. So there's a lot of um, analysis uh, tooling that you can put over a model to understand and verify how it will, how it will perform um, and to kind of help guide you in more sophisticated um, design tasks to make sure that, for instance, to make sure that a piece of software uh, has 100% coverage um, or to make sure that you never divide by zero or there's a lot of different things. And then the last, you know, just to break down the last one, um, it just talks about the Simulink as tooling and uh, not only what it can do but how it, how it helps you get things done. So that's a little bit about Simulink from MathWorks' point of view. Since they make it, they should have a good point of view, right? <laughs> um, so it's also, these are some notes about how I think about it. And one thing that I kind of wish it was explained to me to begin with was that Simulink is a general purpose ODE solver, or ordinary differential equation solver. Um, Time is always a first-class citizen. Um, that doesn't mean you always have to use it as a solver or you always have to use time. But these are really key aspects of Simulink. Um, you can think about it as being driven from or driving MATLAB or even both. Um, there's kind of hooks to, to do it both ways. Um, and I like to think about it as effectively the, the graphical correspondent of MATLAB's text-based environment. So some of the capabilities, there's lots of capabilities and far too much to, to try to cover in, a, in an exhaustive way, but some of the key capabilities <coughs> that, uh, that I think about are the sample time capabilities. So you can talk about time as continuous. You can talk about time as discrete or a hybrid of the two. You can talk about sample times as being fixed, um, as we did in the bouncing ball. Excuse me. You can talk about them being variable, which we'll talk about today. You can talk about them uh, happening at multiple rates. So one subsystem might be operating at two hertz, and another subsystem might be operating at ten hertz. You might talk about it as being event-based, where you know nothing happens until a server is ready to process a new event, and a new event happens, and then these events go on. It doesn't. It's a different kind of way of thinking about sample time. Um, and sim events is what enables that. Uh, and then there's the data type capabilities. So um, all these signals can, can flow information. And they can flow logical information, integer, floating point, all kinds of different things. Um, they're all array capable. Uh, the things that make sense to be are array capable. So, so that's nice because it's implicitly vectorized. We don't even have to change our uh, syntax of how we display them. And it's also great that there's multiple solvers inside Simulink because some solvers are better for one type of problem 
like stiff solvers, for example. Other solvers are better for other things, like discrete solvers that don't have continuous, uh, uh, don't have, that are kind of optimized for discrete models um, that, that don't have continuous sample times. So this is just a little bit of context for Simulink for your for your thinking. Okay, so you've seen this a little bit, but within MATLAB, uh, we can click on the new button, um, and that that will help us create a new Simulink model. We can also click on the the Simulink button there, the little take us to the library, and go click on new from there. I'll just show you. I've showed you already once, but I'll do it again. Um, so here's the new click down, there's Simulink model. And that'll take us to the start page, and we can click on a new blank model or any of the templates that are built in. We can define our own templates, so that starts a new one up for us. Uh, we can click on Simulink, and that'll take us the same place. Um, I think I said that wrong earlier. Uh, this is the library, that's the start page. <laughs> it's a little bit different. Okay. Um, so we'll go back to... said there's there's this new model screen and you can add your own templates or use the built-in ones for like here we see CodeGen or digital filter or feedback controller blank library all these kind of things okay now within the Simulink um, model editor window there's some key buttons I want to point out and there's the Simulink library which is this four four pane window button. There's the model configuration parameters, which is this little gear icon. There's the model explorer, which is um, this icon. There's the run or simulate or execute model, which is the play button. And then there's simulation end time, um, which we can change to be a variable. We can make it an uh, explicit number. We can make it INF for infinity, so it keeps running. And then all this white space is the modeling space. And we can put whatever we want here and just sort of grows to whatever we need it to be. OK, so we've already seen this, but let's just point out some things about it. This is the Simulink library. And the library at the top has the search box. So we can search for things. Um, and then there are different block libraries, like we're highlighting the math operations library. And here are all the blocks within that. These are all Simulink blocks that we can drag and drop. And then there's block library groups, which contain block libraries. So in the Simulink block library group, here are all the different libraries. OK, now let's talk about the configuration parameters. So if I go back a couple of slides, you recall we'll click on this gear box, model configuration parameters button. And that's what will open up this window. And so there's a lot of the different things in here um, they changed this recently where now these are the commonly used parameters. So they're actually even more than this. These are just which ones are commonly used. And you can search in the all parameters if, if there's something you need that uh, you know is there but you can't find. Um, or you can't remember where it is. <clears throat> anyway, I just want to point out some aspects of configuration parameters. Um, so if we, the first thing that comes up is the solver pane. And um, that has our start time and our stop time. And you might think it's kind of odd to be able to set your start time. But think about situations where <clears throat> you might have, maybe it takes uh, a week to do 10 seconds of, of, uh, 10 seconds of simulation. So last week, you started at time 0 and you went to time 10. And this week, you actually want to start at time 10 and go to time 20 and use all the stuff that you did last week as a starting point. So your start time might be 10 and your stop time might be 20. Uh, there's other reasons too, but I think that's the easiest one to kind of uh, talk about. Um, 
you can change whether you're using a variable step or a fixed step solver and change which solver you're using. That's right here with the solve solver options, whether you're variable step or you can change, drop this down to fixed step. Um, and then if you're in variable step, you have a lot of different options here for your maximum step size, your minimum step size, your initial step size, um, how many minimum consecutive steps you can take, um, and there's lots of other things for trimming and zero crossing options and the algorithm there, how many uh, consecutive zero crossings you can have, um, tasking, so there's, there's a lot of different things here, but I just wanted to point out some of these things. All right, so let's make this first one. Um, so we have these constants, 1, 2, and 5. We have a gain block. We have a divide block, an add block, product block, and then four displays. And so we can play around, um, create them all together here. I think what we'll do, um, yeah, we'll just do this one real quick. So I'll switch over to MATLAB again. New simulate model. Okay. So I'll start with some constants. And that one's one. So I'm going to right click and drag this and double click on it, make it two. Make this one five. gain block and I'm going to create its gain at 6 and then we'll want to divide block and it will have a multiply and then divide signal uh, symbol so it has two inputs and then we need an add block and then we need a product block right okay and then we need a number of displays so I'm going to DSP, and we'll kind of separate these things out a little bit. Okay, now let's finish the wiring. Just to match, whoops, that's not what I meant. hit play and see if this uh, gets us what we think we're going to get. 63217. 63217. All right. So this was just a, a little bit more practice and dragging and dropping and uh, pulling things in, um, syncing them into displays and uh, picking off different points and connecting things. So that's good. So I'll save this one as uh, mod 2. So we have a <clears throat> we've talked about the sine function, and um, let's let's look at how they look in time. We talked about it a little bit, so I'm going to click on new here, and I'll close this old one. So what we're talking about here is the sine function and the step function. And we want to. We've already used scopes a little bit, um, but then we can double click on blocks to change the parameters. So let's let's model these things here. So we'll put a sine wave, and uh, I'm going to pull this in from the library so you can see this again. This is from the sources library, and I want the sine wave. And I also want the step. Okay, now if we look at syncs, we can see the display that we've used, we can see the output, something called stop simulation, um, but we 
we're going to use scopes for the moment. Okay. All right, so let's connect these up. call this one time one. Now if I open up this scope and hit run, I'm going to see a sine wave. Okay. And if I look at this scope, we've already run it, we'll see a step function, which at time one, time equals one second, it stepped from zero to one. And we can see this in the parameters of the step function. At at time one, it started zero, the final value became one, and sample time uh, zero, that's um, just happening infinitely fast, effectively. Um, and there's a few things in here that we'll ignore for the moment. Okay, so now we've, we've seen some more signals varying in time, and uh, you can see how zoom in on this thing this oops. I want to point out something real quickly that this actually happened infinitely fast so right at one this went from zero to one and there wasn't a step in between so that's why that, that step time, or the sample time was zero. It actually happened in an instant. So that's, I, just pointing out, that's really kind of a mathematical thing that, that never really happens. <laughs> uh, but uh, this is, you may want it to happen in your simulation to, to make your system behave in a certain way. All right. Okay, so we want to know for this, how is time passing? And we can change these things around. So remember, we have the start, step, end time. So I want to look at this and um, change our parameters just a little bit. Okay, so it's variable step right now. Maybe I want to make our maximum, our minimum step size 0.2 to pick something. Okay. Now I want to look at the sine wave and hit go again. Um, and I'm going to drop down this little configuration thing for the scope, change the style, and add points. So there's no markers right now for points, but I'm going to add these little dots. So you can see these are the actual time solve points. And uh, if we zoom in here just a little bit, we can see they're actually happening at 0 0.2. So 4.0, 4 4.2, 4.4, 4.6, 4.8, 5.0. Okay. So that's, we, we had set our, um, that was our min. What if we change our, start time to 2 and we only go to 6 for example if I hit run again the simulation time is 0 but it's starting at a how do I say this differently a um, an assumed start time so the the, the time that's that this is using as um, simulation time is starting at 2 even though the data starts at, at 0 because it's the first first point in the simulation um, the simulation configuration actually started with a simulation time of 2 um, we could try I'll put that back to 0 we could try a, an initial well you kind of see how these work um, maybe why don't we instead of making it a variable step why don't we make a fixed step and then we'll just change this to a step size 
of 0.5 and say OK. And we can see how this is taking half a second steps. We took one at zero, one at one half, one at one second. Um, and so that, that was the, the smallest step it could take. And you'll notice here, because we constrained this, um, it had to take fixed step sizes, fixed size steps. And we, at 0.5, this was zero. And then because it had to take those steps, such a small time, this new time, it became one. What I'm pointing out here is that this wasn't infinitely fast. This uh, actually took some duration of time. OK. All right. So that kind of gives you a, a lap around the court so as it is. Um, and now it's time to actually take this information and translate the bouncing ball simulation. We did the bouncing ball in MATLAB on the first day, and we're going to translate that over to Simulink and use that kind of like the Rosetta Stone. So um, we'll create um, a nearly exact, um, but because there are different ways of thinking about it, uh, they're not going to be quite so one-to-one -one correspondence, but I think you'll see uh, the similarities and, and how to model with the new notions. There's some caveats. Um, since MATLAB and Simulink have different use cases and visualization techniques, um, we won't add some of the some of the aspects where we were visualizing it in real time um, because it won't make as much sense and it will actually impede how fast the simulation runs. Um, we can't make the same calls the same way we did, so uh, because of the fact reinterpretation time is high, if we try to make MATLAB interpreted function calls, um, th there's some trade-offs here, but uh, we'll, we'll kind of walk through it. So I'm going to pull up uh, the ball one code in just a little bit and talk about how to start translating this stuff, but I just want to make a note that we're going to make we're gonna we're gonna translate groups of code. Um, so we can think of the first section um, was sort of MATLAB workspace housekeeping stuff, where we don't have to worry about translating those because Simulink doesn't have uh, the same housekeeping to do. Uh, the second is really kind of initialization code, and we'll show how to how to initialize things. It, it feels it looks a little different. Um, the first, or excuse me, the third group has to do with tracking history, and we can actually ignore that because of the fact of we automatically can track history uh, with with Simulink since there's an ongoing explicit uh, notion of time. So one of the first things we need to do is because that um, MATLAB function or that MATLAB script um, talked about time in a fixed step way, we're going to change this to fixed step and we're going to make the step size 124th. So let's do that real quick. All right. So I'm going to save this new one and call it all sim one. Okay. All right. Now I'm gonna again. I'm gonna click on the configuration parameters. And I'm gonna change the fixed step, uh, the type to fixed step, and I'm gonna make the size one over twenty four. Say okay. That's good. 
I think we'll leave it at 10 for the moment. Uh, stop time of 10. Okay, now we need to be able to post-process the results outside, but we'll get to that a little bit later. So that's it for the slides. Now it's it's uh, it's all about the model, right? So let's pull up fall one dot m, and we'll look at that over here and maximize it. Okay. So now we have our source, what we want to copy, and what we want to create over here. What we want to copy from and, and create the model of over here. So we need something. We're, we're first just going to talk about one. If you recall, we only modeled our position x and it bounced back and forth. So let's just model our x stuff first. Now, um, the way we're going to do this, like I mentioned, even though signals are kind of like variables, we actually need something that can hold on to the last value a little longer. Um, <clears throat> and what we need to do that, as you might expect, um, maybe it's intuitive, is we need something called a memory block. Um, so that what the memory block does is whatever the last sample time was, so let's say, <clears throat> I'll just demonstrate this real quick, we have a step function. Um, put a scope on the other side of it and actually put another scope watching the step function. So if you have the same two functions, okay, so scope one, if you remember this happened right, looks like point 997 or so. Okay, when did this happen? Scope is um, 1.043. So it actually happened one step later. And that's because whatever the step size we're taking, this memory block um, just output the next time later. And it did the same thing the next time later. Okay, so. That's all well and good, but we need to initialize. That's what we're trying to do here. So we're just talking about x, and we want to say the initial position of x is zero. Well, if I double click on memory, you can, if you think about it, the fact that the very first sample time through here, it won't have a previous sample time. It won't have a previous sampled value. So we have to give it a zero. Uh, we don't have, it doesn't have to be zero, but we're going to give it a zero as its initial condition. And that's how we initialize. Okay. Um, <clears throat> we will need something called gravity, but I'm going to wait on that one for just a second. We'll also need something called velocity. Um, and we'll actually take that, put it over here same idea and we're going to say the initial velocity is 25. Oops, 20 I think. So I made it. Okay. So we'll call this memory block position and this memory block we'll call velocity. Okay. Now, how do we so we want to think about this while wow block. And if you recall, I had talked about before that we can think of Simulink a little bit like a train track switching station. Um, it's one way to think of it at least. And we're, we're sort of switching back and forth. How do we direct signals through blocks to accomplish what we want to do? And so we have a loop here happening, right? And we want to Let's, let's take a look at what's going on in our block. These things we uh, commented out. This was all, these things were all uh, having to do with these things, these three, 
for all having to do with display. And then we said, here's the new position, use the old position, and then the, the new position is equal to the old position plus whatever the velocity is times the step. And we've already established our step here. So let's uh, make a constant and its value is one over 24. Okay, I'm gonna hide the name of that just because it's a little bit ugly. All right, and uh, we have a velocity. And so we can put these two things together with the product block. There's our step, there's our velocity. Okay, we need to add that with the old position. So the output of this block is the old position. So if I have a summing block, look what I can do here. There's the old position. There's the product of velocity and time step. That now becomes the new position. OK. OK, very good. Um, so we kind of have one input here that's left. What do we do with that? Um, it's currently taking in nothing, but it has an initial condition of 20. So how about we just put for the beginning, uh, for starters rather, um, this value of 20. Okay. If I save this and press go, okay, we have something. So I'm going to put a scope on one of these signals, and I kind of want to see what's going on with the new sig with the new position. Let's see what's going on here. Okay, it's taking off because there's no collision, right? In our MATLAB stuff, we had these if statements for collisions. All right, they collided at particular borders. And just kind of ignore the uh, I subscripts. That's that's in order to vectorize that thing. Um, <clears throat> here we, we won't have to worry about that. Um, so how can we make the same kind of if statement, but we want to integrate that into our railroad tracks here, right? All right, so. The question it's asking is if this new position x is greater than something. So let's take a look at our library. I'm going to look at some logic stuff. And it's got compare to constant, compare to zero. <clears throat> How about we compare it? Hmm. We could make a relational operator. Why don't we put the, we'll try the relational operator. Okay. So I'm going to hide the name of this because it's pretty obvious what it does. Same with this one. Okay. Now here we have if position x is greater than 20. Greater than or equal to 20. So I'm going to change this to greater than or equal to. And it's, it's if the first input is greater than or equal to the second input. So I'm going to drag and drop a constant over to 20. OK. Now, if you recall, that if this was true, we should do something. So here's what we're going to do. Um, this portion was talking about how far we might have overshot our boundary. So we created our difference or our, you know, what the change was, delta in x, right there, and then we compensated for it on the second line. But I want to ignore that for a moment and focus on the big thing that happens in a collision, and that's reversing the velocity. Okay, so 
<clears throat> let's say that we have something coming into velocity um, that can be going one of two directions. How about? Um, we need a switch to do this. So I'm going to type switch. Okay. I'm going to make this just a little bit bigger. Okay, so this switch feeds into velocity and it says take in switch between, so here we kind of come back to the railroad crossing, uh, the railroad track idea. If this is true, then take in this number, and if it's not true, take in this other number. Okay, all right, well, <clears throat> so let's think this through. If we're greater than or equal to 20, then we want to turn around. So if we're not greater than or equal to 20, we want to be 20 going forward. So I'm going to tie this back around to the the port that decides help this helps this decide uh, whether to make a whether to use port one or port two. If it is greater than 20, then we want this to be minus 20. Okay. All right, so let's try this. Let's just see how this works. Okay. So what happened? All right, so we were start at zero. We progressed up. And we got up here to 20. And we're taking 1 24th second steps, just like we expected. And we get to 20. And then we turn around. And then because we've turned around, we uh, want to turn around again, because we're less than 20. And now we're e greater than or equal to 20, so we turn around. But this isn't what we want, right? This isn't what we wanted. So what we need is some way to tell whether we switch or don't switch. OK. So let's, um, let's take a step forward. So this is the one x. Let's look at the other x. That's less than or equal to negative 20. So let's create that condition also. So I'm going to change this to less than or equal to, and the other input to negative 20. OK. I'll connect this to our position. All righty. So if neither of these things, uh, this position x or this position x call, are true, then I just want to use whatever it was that was happening before, right? Um, so let's see. How could we rethink about this? If, why don't we? Go back to our library for a second and use a logical operator. And I want to say if one or the other is true, then use the output of this thing. Then we need to switch directions. also because we don't really need to have it said twice. Okay. So now we see there's there's really two switches we need. One that switches between 20 or positive minus 20 or positive 20. Excuse me, negative 20 or positive 20. And another that switches between status quo and change. Right? So, how do we do it like this? I'll flip it around. Um, it's pretty obvious that these are switches, so I'm going to hide their names to make it a little less messy. All right, so if either one of these boundaries has been violated, 
then we want to use uh, <clears throat> if that's true then we want to use the new value we want to use either positive or negative 20 but if that's not true we really just want to use whatever we were using before so here I'm going to rotate this back around. Um, here, I'm actually going to take whatever we had, whatever direction we were going before. So if neither of those boundaries are encroached upon, in other words, if this evaluates to false, it's neither greater than or equal to 20, nor less than or equal to negative 20, I'm going to use whatever our velocity was before. Okay, let's try this. Hey, hey, that looks like more like what we were expecting, right? We have this constant velocity, and then we go back down when we hit this, um, when we hit this boundary, and then we come back up. Okay, very good. So now we have a model that uh, works well. Um, we can actually uh, take this whole model, put it in a subsystem, and we'll put an out port, I'll call it out one. So now here's our x. Now this is great. This is the best part. Right click, drag, now we have y. <laughs> so we're going to call this x coordinate. We'll call this one the y coordinate. And we'll give this a little bit different starting stuff. How about uh, I don't know, 10, and it'll bounce between negative 10 and positive 10. And we could change where our boundaries are, but I think we'll just leave them at 20. And maybe we want to start with a slightly different initial condition of, say, 5. Okay, so if I take a scope here, two inputs for it, x and y coordinates, press go. Okay, does this make sense? So we're, remember the x uh, axis here is time and y axis is position. The yellow one is our x position, the blue is our y position. And we changed y to have effectively half the speed of x. And they're still bouncing off the borders like we wanted. But they're not getting there as fast. It looks like about twice as slow, which is looks good. This one bounces twice, while it takes this one only about uh, takes two two bounces for this one to bounce once. So that looks like it's working right. That's really good. So here's our this is our first reinterpretation. All right. So this is fixed step, and uh, I want to point out a couple quick things. In here, these um, boxes have enabled, uh, checked, enable zero crossing detection. So you recall that right here we said, hey, what about um, <laughs> what about when we go past? And we will go past. So well, what happens? Well, here we're just we're not worrying about it. We effectively went past it and then and that's only because we're using this this fixed step solves. We're using this particular time sample step. But we don't have to. 
and that's one of the great things about this. So uh, let's, because it has variable step solving technology. Um, I just want to zoom in here and show you, for example, this one goes past. Um, it actually went to minus 20.8 before it. Uh, so it took another step. It went past the border, but we want it to bounce right at the border. So we effectively want to create a new solved sample step right there. Um, and we don't really need all the ones in between. Before we do this, though, um, I want to show you how we can analyze and visualize the actual bouncing ball bouncing around. So in order to do that, we will add some sinks. And this time, we'll use something called a two workspace. So I'm going to double click on it and change the variable name to x and sample time to 124 and save format to array. OK, everything else we can leave. So one of those will go to there, and the other one will go to there. Change this one to y. All right, so if I press go again, press you know execute or start, run, I mean the same thing. Um, I want to point out that I now have a T out, which is uh, just a default time out variable that Simulink makes. And I also have an X and a Y. So I'm going to do the most natural thing and just say plot X and Y. Okay. Interestingly, this is pretty good. This is kind of what we expected, isn't it? Um, we're bouncing around. Uh, we started probably here, and we went up and then bounced back around. And we can do all of our processing on this the same way. If I make a, uh, I'm not going to do clear because that that would clear this data. But I will do a CLC and a format compact. And now. <coughs> We've talked about looking at the lengths and sizes of things. If I said len equals length of x, um, and then a for loop for i equals 1 to len, if I plot x i, y i, these are just vectors that have been created, right? They're 241 by 1. If I plot these things, um, and I'm going to use a dot, and I'm going to use marker size 20, and then I'm going to pause for 1 24th of a second. And before the pause, I'm going to set x lens. In other words, the x-coordinate limit from minus 22, positive 22. Okay. Uh, I'm going to turn the grid on. I think that's all I need to do. So I'll do a control enter. All right. This looks more like what we're used to seeing, right? Um, and it kind of visually makes sense. And, all right. Well, what if we what if we wanted to make this variable step? Okay. That way we can we can be more efficient in our solve, and we can <clears throat> uh, we don't have to worry about going past the negative twenty and positive twenty boundaries. Okay. I'll save this one real quick. Go to the editor, save. I'll call this one post one. As we're post processing, we're, we're analyzing this. All right, now what do I need to do? Well, the stuff works right, but there's two key things. 
The first thing is we're going to change our solve parameters to not be fixed step anymore. So we're stepping up in the world, <laughs> pun intended. Uh, we're going to go to variable step. All right. And for the moment, we're going to leave everything just like it is and say OK. OK, so we know that this is no longer true. It's not a constant uh, step size. So what we need to know is, what is the step size? All right, so what we need is an import first. Because we're going to make another little subsystem that will tell us. PS, the time sample. Um, and we'll make a subsystem over here. Won't have an import, it'll just have an out for it, and this will be TS. All right, so let's talk about this. How do we calculate our sample time? Well, what is sample time? Obviously, it involves time, so we'll probably need a clock. It's a good starting point. Whoops. Um, what else? It involves the difference between one sample time and the next one. So we'll probably need a memory. So we can talk about the last sample time. It involves the difference. So we'll probably need a sum. So if I have a sum here, and uh, I'm going to add a negative sign. So that'll be actually the difference, not the sum. And what I want is whatever the current time is, whatever the last time was, I would like to know the difference. OK. But there's only one problem. What's the very first one? This is kind of a time boundary condition problem. What's our very first sample time? Well, if I set this to zero and the first sample time, maybe it probably is going to put the first sample time at zero. It's zero minus zero, which is zero, which makes the simulation think we haven't done anything yet as far as sample times go. Well, that's a problem if we think about this because of the fact that that means we're going to take our last velocity and shove it back in and multiply by zero. So, okay, how could I know what the very first step size is going to be? All right, let's let's kind of walk through this. Um, well, first of all, we could set the first step size. All right, now I'm going to, uh, there's, there's a defined um, variable that's essentially very small called epsilon um, within MATLAB. And I think it's defined as uh, the value between the double floating point precision uh, between the numbers 1 and the next largest number. That that's that's called epsilon, and if we can uh, go in here and actually type in EPS, it'll tell us how big that is. So, 2.22 e to the minus 16, well times 10 to the minus 16. So very very small. So why don't we say that we'll have a switch, and the very first one that goes through there. will have a value of epsilon. We know that's we know that's going to be true. That is our first sample time. Okay. But after a certain amount of time, this will be true. Okay.
So how do we know when that's going to be true? Well, if we have a step, so we use a step input here. And why don't we step at EPS plus EPS. Uh, we can just step at EPS. That's when we'll start using the other one. All right, so that should work. Um, so this is effectively going to ignore the first, so our initial condition for this doesn't matter. And that should give us the right sample times if we did that correctly. And I'm going to do the same thing with the speeds here. Minus 10, minus 10. We can be at 20, make our initial velocity 10. Okay, that's pretty good. Uh, we wanted this to be Y, remember? And that will draw off the same TS. Interesting. Can look at how much uh, finer points this solved at. I'd also like to point out we actually generated points at exactly at the places we needed to collide at. So let's um, change the style here. Turn on markers and take a look. Actually. Um, want to turn on markers for both of them. Uh, so X chord and Y chord also. All right. Now, so this shows you the solve points. Um, what if we change our solve points to be a little broader? We have min and maximum set to uh, automatic. What if we don't let it go any smaller than 0 0.3? Those are pretty big steps. If I hit run again, oh, I think I did that backwards. I'm sorry. <clears throat> That's the minimum. So we are taking steps of 0 0.4, 0 0.8, 1.2. No, these are actually smaller than that. Let's see what's going on. Why is it that that's inheriting the sample time? Okay. These should all be infinite. Oh, you know why? This is drawing them out faster. We need actually to not, we actually want to inherit the sample time for these two workspace variables. It's making sure that that's pulling the data in faster and it's forcing the solver to solve faster than we really want it to. Okay. All right. So, I want to set it to a value large enough that you can see why we need to do this. So, 
So how about 1.1 as a minimum? Still forcing the solve with a, a larger size. Any of those? Okay. That's fine. That's fine. All right. Well, there's a little. Did I fix both of these? I think I did. Minus one. This was minus one. Well, there's a little bug here, but the key point I want you to, to look at is the fact that these are not the same distance apart. Um, they're taking steps and it's inserting a solve point right at the, the place that we need, right at 20 and right at um, negative 20 for both of these, which isn't a natural, you know, it doesn't automatically do that. Um, and that's, that's super valuable because, oops, because that allows us to, uh, you know, really, allows us to really, uh, focus on our algorithm and not focus so much on the solution and all this you know boundary conditions of it um, I think that was all I wanted to cover today kind of helping uh, helping you get your feet on the ground with Simulink um, I think I wonder if I had forgotten something else in here but um, yeah I think that's all good Thank you for your attention, and uh, hope to hope that you're getting a lot out of these videos. And I'll see you next time.